we are seeing the spike in Hong Kong and China as the World Health Organization has been considering declaring an end to the pandemic. Does this signal to you that it could get worse or maybe a lot worse before it gets better? Thanks, Emily, for having me. It's nice to see you again. You know, I, I think obviously we've had these spikes before. We've seen, you know, multiple mutations arising from COVID-19, and this continues to be an ongoing issue that we're monitoring here at ARC. Uh, one of the things that we're thinking about is disruptive technologies that are in our portfolios that could potentially help the crisis. So, you know, one such technology is CRISPR, which is essentially working to look at um, different cases and potentially being a diagnostic tool, but it's also used as a therapeutic tool as well. Now, China has had a zero COVID policy shutting down versus vaccinating on a broad scale. They've been using the Sinovac vaccine when they do vaccinate, but that's a vaccine that doesn't use mRNA technology and appears to be not as effective. Are we seeing that vaccine and that technology breaking down? It's possible at ARC, we've been very focused on the mRNA technology. And so we know that we've seen pretty great um, results from it from the US um, and also from Israel where we've gotten a substantial amount of data. And so, you know, this mRNA technology is a novel technology. It hasn't been used prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, we're following very closely what the companies are doing and how they're utilizing that technology, including, you know, Moderna, but also Arcturus Therapeutics um, and several other companies that really are focusing, you know, of course we can talk about Pfizer and the partnerships that they've started there, but also just the the amount of sheer data that we're going to get from mRNA and be able to compare that to the adenovirus vaccines as well. How has the pace of innovation in mRNA and biotechnology accelerated during the pandemic, given the role we've seen it play in vaccinations, along with CRISPR, as you mentioned? Yeah, so the pace of innovations, Emily, is really interesting because we're seeing that, you know, I think CRISPR is, is an excellent example, as you mentioned, right? So we're seeing these amazing examples. So prior to CRISPR, you know, zinc finger nucleases, another gene editing form, also talons were in existence. And essentially those took a really long time to move from discovery to the first human dose. So that happened for zinc fingers in roughly eight years, whereas CRISPR took less than half that time. They were th about three years. They also can target many more unknown diseases. And so what we're seeing is there's a proliferation in terms of the pace of innovation. An example for that could be CRISPR therapeutics. They're working on creating potentially functional cures for diseases like sickle cell and beta thalassemia. They've treated about 70 patients along with their partner Vertex, both companies within our genomic strategy. And we're seeing the data looks like it could potentially really be a functional cure. And so the pace of innovation, but also what's happening within innovation is really exciting right now. Meantime, there's a controversy evolving in the gene editing world, which I know that you are following closely, where Nobel Prize winner Jennifer Doudna, who's made important discoveries in mRNA technology and been recognized for her work on CRISPR, um, has lost a patent dispute surrounding the discovery of her and her team around a specific part of CRISPR technology. What does this mean and, and how significant is this? That's right, Emily. You know, first of all, I think it's great we're talking about this because it demonstrates a commitment from the scientists across the board. Um, it's also quite a complicated topic. So I think it's great to delve in a little bit here. So first of all, what is CRISPR? Maybe we can back up a little bit on that. So CRISPR is a precise tool that is used for gene editing. Um, we believe in it. We've been investing in it for years. We think it's an incredibly innovative tool um, and it's revolutionizing the way we think about treatments but also potential cures. Just to a little bit of background here, it's essentially from a family of DNA sequences, and it was found to affect the genomes of bacteria, and it's now potentially using and in trials to be used for correcting genes in humans. So about the patent dispute, as you mentioned. So really quick background here, you, you know, you covered some of this really helpful. In 2012, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, they wrote a paper and it detailed the CRISPR system, but they didn't show that it worked in eukaryotic cells. And 
essentially, Emily, a eukaryotic cell is a cell that has a nuclease. So that could be um, a plant, and it's also certainly a human. Fang Zhang at Harvard Broad was the first one to do this. Um, so there's essentially two sides, Jennifer Downer and Emmanuel Charpentier on one side, that houses that IP from CBC, which is the University of Vienna, also UC Berkeley for both of them. Other side, Fang Zhang, Harvard, and the Broad. So in 2020, as you mentioned, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna actually won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for their discovery of CRISPR-Cas9. But right. as you mentioned, this past week, we saw that the USPTO, or US Patent and Trademark Office, did not um, follow suit. So um, what does this mean? Getting to the point here, um, this doesn't stop any ongoing trials. Um, so all clinical trials will continue. It doesn't affect IP outside of the US. The most likely outcome that ARC sees is through some form of cross-licensing among the companies. And in terms of sort of the specifics for companies, so Editas, Verve, and Beam get their IP through Editas or the Broad Harvard, and then CRISPR and Intellia through CBC, so through uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dowd now.